So, good morning everybody. Welcome back for this last day of the conference. It's a pleasure to introduce you Matthias and Vittorino from Imperial College. He will talk about propagation of cows by Domacumbo. So, please. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to come and to speak. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, a joint work I have with my both uh, postdoc mentors, which are Jose Carillo and Greg Pagliotis at Imperial College. And, okay, so I'll be talking about like mean field limits by gamma convergence or propagation of chaos. Okay, so this is similar to some things that we've seen uh, during talks in this uh, in this conference. So I'm going to talk about a pretty simple model that has been introduced before. So we're going to have n indistinguishable particles that live in a, the torus or a convex set in Rd. And uh, the idea is that we're going to have a system of particles that are interacting and we have uh, the effect of noise. Okay? So they all have a Brownian motion. So instead of looking at the particle system, the SD, we're going to look at the joint probability density. So it's what is the probability I can find uh, particles in a particular location. So this is a probability that is going to be living in the symmetric probabilities of omega to the n. Okay? So this is just uh, whenever you increase the particles, the, the state space becomes shorter. Uh, one of the things I should remark is that because we have indistinguishable particles, uh, we'll be talking about symmetric probability measure. Okay, so whenever you take, uh, you ch exchange a particle xi by a particle xj, then the probability stays the same. Okay, so one of the things, uh, if you look at the forward convolutional equation, so if you look at the what is the probability that you'll find uh, the particles, then it will be satisfying this linear equation. Okay. This is a linear equation, but it's a uh, high dimension. Okay, so this, uh, as when you increase the particles, these increase the dimension of the state space, and we want to pass to the limit in this equation. Okay, and so here H n is de uh, depending on v and w, and it's just the sum over uh, the different coordinates uh, with respect to here. It should be a large and <coughs> smaller. Okay. All right, so uh, what is the propagation of chaos in this case? Uh, this is um, a result by Snitzman, I think, classically. Uh, so when you take n to infinity, and you take the little n marginal of uh, rho n, then this is decoupling, and it's actually, e it's in the limit, is equal to n copies of the solution of the mean field equation. Okay, so before we had a linear, before we had a linear equation, and now we have a nonlinear equation, which is given by this. Okay, so this is a classical result, and it was done by coupling and looking at the difference between the two things. Uh, okay, so there are later developments. Uh, this result is for uh, regular V and W. Yeah, usually Lipschitz continuous. Um, but then there is like some later developments. I mean, uh, people now are now looking for rates. And you can actually look for, I think there are basically optimal rates in this paper by Durmus, Silverberg, Guillem, and Seymour. I'm not sure if they're optimal, but I'm pretty sure they're optimal. And they are like just not looking at this coupling, but they are looking at slightly more complicated coupling. Okay, so from now on, for the purpose of this talk, uh, we are going to assume that V and W are lambda convex. And uh, W satisfies a W condition, this is just a technical thing. So we are going to set up in the simplest frame possible because we want to prove this result uh, just by using gradient flow techniques. Okay, so this is similar to what um, uh, Matthias Server was doing in his talk. <coughs> okay, so let's talk about the gradient flow structure. So at the level of the raw n, uh, raw n is a gradient flow of the energy Fn. Um, in the two buses and distance on omega to the n. Okay, so I mean this is fairly classical. This is just uh, this is just um, potential term. Okay, but in the limit, what we have is that the mean field limit is the gradient flow of the mean field energy, 
which now uh, this HN, you remember, was de defined with respect to V and W, uh, decouples as a potential term and this interaction term Q. Okay? And the gradient flow is with respect to the two buses and distance, now on omega. And here you have omega to the x. Okay, so that's the end dependence on the metric Q. Okay, so we want to take a limit when n goes to infinity, and we want to see where does this energy go. So it should be going to this energy. And where does this metric go? It should be going to something like the bus system. Uh, OK, so one of the things that you need to first do is to normalize the energy. So if you have n particles, then you will take the mean energy. And you're going to take uh, the normalized two bus system distance, because I mean, you just can think that if you take n to infinity, this distance will start becoming plus infinity. Okay, so the right normalization is 1 over square root of n in this case. Okay, and this is still the gradient flow. I just actually just change the. If you put 1 over n here, you have to one, put 1 over square root of n to preserve the structure. Okay, so uh, the main point of this talk is just to use something that was known for a, a long time is that when you take n to infinity, you can actually um, figure out what is the limit of symmetric probability measures. Okay, so if you take a sequence of symmetric probability measures that live in a bigger and bigger <coughs> state space, then you should have in the limit some probability that lives in omega to the infinity. But instead of having omega to infinity, we have a, something that lives in the probabilities of the probabilities. Okay, so if you have a sequence of um, symmetric probability functions, then you will have a subsequence and a, a x, which is in the probabilities of probabilities, such that uh, the distance between the marginal of rho n and x to the n, which I'll define in a second, is going to zero. Okay, so the idea is that, well, okay, so this is the marginal. And here, x to the n is just you are taking um, you are taking averages of chaotic like uh, metrics. Okay, so this is x is defined in uh, the probabilities of omega, and so here I'm integrating over the probabilities of omega. Okay, and here we are taking the pairing, which is this should be rho tensor n, little f. Okay, so the, the main point is that now we know what the limiting space is. We need to pass, uh, pass to the limit into this space. Okay, so that's the main point of this talk. So instead of uh, the infinite number of particles are passing to some gradient flow, which is in an infinite dimensional space. Okay, so I hadn't defined the two buses and distance because I was going to define it now. But now instead of defining it for a... Yes. The little n was fixed there? Or? In this case, the little n is fixed, yes. Okay. Yeah. So for every little n, this is true. Mm -hmm. And this, yeah, it's a different one. Um, so, um, okay, so if we have two probabilities of probabilities uh, of omega, we can define the buses time distance between them. And so the idea is that. Whenever you have a complete metric space, you can define the bus and distance. And so the, the, this, I, I put a weird letter because it's a weird space. Uh, the distance between x and y is just the infimum over all the couplings of the bus and distance uh, squared between the measures. OK? So it's pretty fairly like elementary. I mean, it's what you would think the bus and distance needs to be. And this is well defined, and it has all the right properties. Um, okay, so yeah, you need to think of this as the bus and distance in on the metric space um, probabilities of omega d2. Okay, so one of the things uh, that you need to do to pass to the limit in gradient flows is to pass to the limit in the metric. So I had introduced a metric in the third slide, and now what we want to say is that this is related to the metric in the limit. So. Uh, this is a theorem that we were trying to do it and then uh, started talking with somebody else and then they pointed me to this uh, Jorge and Michelin paper in which they prove exactly this. So if you take uh, the average 1 over n of the square of the nth um, of the nth uh, buses and distance, then you are converging to the, in the limit, you will be converging to this buses and distance in the probabilities of the probabilities. 
Okay, and so what is the proof of this? The proof of this is passing by the empirical measures. So the idea is that because uh, the probabilities are symmetric, if you pass to the if you pass to the empirical measures, so the empirical measure is just the sum over the delta xi when you are like taking you are pushing uh, rho n onto the probabilities of the probabilities by taking the empirical measure. Okay, so this guy lives in the space that we are talking about. And what we can say is that the empirical measures associated with row 1 and row 2 is an isometry. Okay? So this guy is a straight up isometry in this sense. Okay? And so this observation, the, the proof of this, uh, it just follows because if you take symmetric probability measures, then the optimal plans are symmetric, and then you can see that these distances are actually equal. Okay, so another thing that is on the Jorge Michler paper is that now the characterizations of this convergence are all equivalent. Okay, so the, that the empirical measure converges to x in this larger space is the same as the marginals converge for every little n, and it's also the same that this average basis and distance goes to zero. Okay, they're all equivalent. So if, in a sense, if I put, uh, if you put a result like this in the background. You are also saying this. Okay, so they're all it's all one and the same. Okay, so I passed to the limit in the metric. Uh, what can we say about the energy? Okay, so now we know what the metric is, and now we want to pass to the limit in the energy. So um, the idea is that this was a classical result, which was in statistical physics, and written like this. It wasn't written like this in this paper by Messner and Spohn, but if you look in the background, they're proving the convergence of minimizers to minimizers, so if you look fairly carefully, there is a gamma convergence result. So, if you don't know what gamma convergence result, you can think of point-wise convergence uh, more than. And uh, so, this is working on like the Robinson and Ruel uh, approach. If you're taking the average of the entropy, then in the, in the end, it decouples. Okay? So, um, yeah, then there is newer accounts by Ruggeri and even Jorge and Michler prove some, some parts of it in their paper. So the idea is that f infinity is just given as uh, a potential term. So this is the mean field energy I had introduced before, but now this is integrated on the whole probability space. Okay? So this was a result that was available in the literature. And so we was just, okay, now we have the convergence of the metric and we have the convergence of the, uh, the, uh, the gamma convergence of the energy. Can we pass to the limit in the gradient? Okay, this is not true in general, but in this case we will actually make it work. Okay, so just to give you an idea of why perhaps you would like to think in the space of probabilities, <laughs> of probabilities instead of propagation of chaos, even in this paper of uh, Messer and Spohn, this was the example that they were given. So you just take the Kuramoto model, so you take uh, the torus, uh, you take a zero potential term, and you take the cosine interactions. And I put a two because uh, when you put a two, uh, you know that the minimizer, so we have a perfectly uh, periodic problem, and the minimizer looks like this. Okay? And this is translation invariant. So then this is row infinity, but if this is a minimizer of the energy, this is also a minimizer of the energy. Okay, so this is just would be a translation of your minimizer where here you just put h. Okay? So this is a minimizer, this is also a minimizer, and any translation of this is also a minimizer. So relating to what um, Professor Pulverni was saying yesterday. So in the mean field limit, you do not have a unique stationary state. You do not have a unique minimizer of the energy. But at the level of the particle system, we have a unique Gibbs measure. And so if you look at the Gibbs measure, then you can pass to the limit into this space, and you can actually figure out that because there is a translation invariance in the problem, you will have to be converging to the average of all of the translations of Roy Fenn. Okay? So this measure does not satisfy a chaos assumption. Okay? So if you take the limit of this, it doesn't decouple. 
Okay, it's not a pro infinite product of raw infinite so, and its translation part. Okay, so these measures, in some sense, exist. So looking at this type of uh, framework, at least in the problems that um, Professor Pulvirenti was describing yesterday, is a good idea. Okay, so, all right, this was to just motivate why we want to do this in this setting and not in the just propagation of chaos setting. Uh, but now, can we pass to the limiting gradient flow? So, in general, it's not actually true that if you have the convergence of the metric and you have the convergence of the gamma convergence of the energy, you can actually pass to the limit in the gradient flow. This is not true. And you can have a really easy example by taking, uh, let's do x dot is equal to uh, the gradient of g epsilon x with a minus and now g epsilon is just equal to x squared over 2 plus epsilon cosine of epsilon ok, so if you take this energy which um, let's say this is x squared you take smaller and smaller things if you take this energy which is really simple you know, it's a 1D model you can actually compute the solution explicitly pass to the limit and you can see uh, that the limit of this uh, flow will not be the, the gradient flow of x squared okay? so there are some extra effects that come out here you have some thinning and so this is a really easy example to show that the convergence of the gamma convergence of flows is not enough to converge. Okay, nevertheless, we were able to pass to the limit, so this problem has to have a bit more structure. And the point is that the extra structure that we have is that the energies are uniformly lambda convex. Okay, so if you uh, the point of this energy is that the second derivatives of g epsilon are exploding like one over epsilon, one over epsilon. Okay, so here, if we can show that uh, this is a theorem by Savare, Daniel Savare, but the concept of being able to pass to gradient flows uh, using uh, convex energies, I think is probably way before that. But I mean, these are these are the references I found for this. Okay, so uh, the idea is that now we set up the, f the framework. Uh, the, the point is that here, the only thing you need to check to pass to the limit is that the energy are uniformly lambda convex. Okay, then you have an extra hypothesis that the, your initial condition has finite energy and you are converging to a particular extent. Okay, and one of the things that follows out of this theorem is that in the limit, you have a unique gradient flow of f infinity. F infinity was the, the energy, the, the average of the main field energy. Okay, so what is the proof of this? And I cannot give a course of uh, gradient flows in like five minutes. So the, the point is the following. Uh, you are a solution to the gradient flow if and only if you satisfy this inequality, which is called, called, called the evolutionary variational inequality. So morally you are relating the the derivative of the distance of your flow with respect to a, a base measure with the change in the energy. Okay? So you are a solution to the gradient flow if and only if you satisfy this equation. And this equation also gives you uniqueness. Okay? So you satisfy, if you satisfy the, this equation, then you can use a crandall ligand trick to show that you have uniqueness of solutions. Um, Okay, so the point is that this, is, this inequality holds true if you have convexity of your energies and now you can pass to the limit in this Okay, and the idea is that you just need to pass to the limit in the metric which we already know how to do and you have to pass to the limit in the factor which we already know how to do Okay, so I mean that's the proof of the, for the previous theorem and the idea is that using it for our particular case if we take W and B, which are lambda convex, then what we're going to get is that this is uniformly lambda convex. Uh, sorry. So, okay, so in particular, what we get if we have lambda convexity, uh, we have this propagation of chaos mean field limit result in which rho n, rho n 
is converging to the gradient flow of f infinity, but you can actually characterize the gradient flow of f infinity by saying that it's the push forward of the solution semi-group to the mean field equation of your initial condition epsilon. Okay, so you need to think of ST as a map that is going from the probabilities to the probabilities. So X naught is a probability on the probabilities, so you can push it forward. Okay? So in a sense, what we are saying is that X naught is solving the ODE with the gradient of the mean field equation. Okay? You can write that formally uh, infinite dimensional PDE, which I don't think it makes sense in any anyway, but so what we are saying is that DP of X plus the divergence of the gradient of f and f times x is equal to zero. Okay, so this is solving a continuity equation with a potential term, which is the mean field equation. Okay, so but this is in infinite dimensions. This doesn't make sense. Okay. All right. Um, as a corollary, we get propagation of case. So if we know that x0, if we know that originally the, the initial condition is decoupled, then we get, we recover Snitman result. Okay? So it's the same thing. Just with a different, uh, just with a different way of like doing this. Okay, and so what I was saying before is that the proof of the theorem is just if w and b are lambda convex, then we can show that this uh, potential term hn over n Okay, so the energy before, just to remind you a bit, so fn over n is equal to the integral of hn over n b rho n plus rho <coughs> log rho. Okay, so this term is convex, and this term is convex as long as, long as hn over n is convex. Okay? And the convexity, you can actually calculate the Hessian of Hn over n with respect to the Hessian of W and B. And you can check that if W and B are bounded below by lambda times identity, this guy is bounded below by 3 lambda times identity. Okay, so, and then the, to finish the proof, you also show that uh, the push forward ST of X0 is also satisfying the EVI. So is, hence it has to be the unique uh, gradient flow solution to f infinity. Okay? Alright, so that is the result. Um, I guess the question would be uh, why did we want to do this? This is a result that was already there. Uh, we are not pushing regularity, we are not pushing anything. So, I mean, the point is we were just trying to sort of prove a concept. I mean, you can do this by doing the gamma convergence uh, result, and this is the right framework to look at it. Okay, so, I mean, uh, at least for us, being that we uh, were trained in like uh, uh, this gradient flow theory, it's, it's a good thing to have, and a good way of actually visualizing the problems. Not necessarily powerful enough to do anything, but that's what we are trying to figure out, if we can actually do something more with this. So, the things that we're trying to do now with this type of approach is looking at homogenization problems. So the idea would be to try to look uh, in an energetic way uh, the joint limits of oscillatory potentials and particles going to infinity. Okay? So if you start having oscillations in your potential and also having end to infinity, what is the right scaling between the oscillations and the particle limit to get <coughs> and what in which in which uh, regimes do you get uh, the homogenization result, and in which regimes do you get the propagation of chaos result? Okay, so you might want to think of this as like you are introducing oscillations uh, which are dependent on the number of particles. Okay, and this is something that we are working with uh, Richard and with uh, Greg Pagliottis, and we have some results using some of these techniques in respect of trying to pass to the limit first in the oscillations and then in the number of particles or the other way around. Okay? And it doesn't look like the limits commute. Okay? If you, so if you first take the oscillations too fast and then take the limit of the particles, it's not the same if you do it the other way around. Okay, and then uh, what is the what would be the hope of this technique? Uh, this is a problem that we looked and it seems that there might be some hope 
to try to pass to Newtonian repulsion using this technique. Okay, uh, I mean, this might be too much to ask for, but what is the idea here? So, the idea is that in the, in the Newtonian repulsion case, the mean field equation is satisfying a cons uh, convexity property, okay? A really, really weak convexity property. So, uh, the, in the mean field energy, in the case of Newtonian repulsion, the energy is omega convex in the mean. Okay, and this omega convex would be enough to make our proof work. But then the question is, can we show a similar property for finite time? So if we do, can we show this omega convexity property at the level of the n-particle system? Okay, and that would be a way of passing to the limit in the Newtonian repulsion case. Okay, so the, the, the limiting equation is well posed in the sense of gradient flow, so then the question would be if you can do this at the level of the n-particle system. I think this is a really hard problem, and at the end of the day, it should be all equivalent, but it's another way of looking at the same problem. Okay, I mean, there are some results already by Serpati in this thing, so, I mean, so it wouldn't be necessarily all new. Um, so the question is, in a sense, for finite then, can we show that the, the uh, can we show that we are satisfying an EBI? So if, we are, if you are able to satisfy an EBI at the finite end level, then you can pass the limit. Okay, and this is the way we pass the limit. Okay, and I guess my time is up. So thank you, and let me know if you have any questions. So, I, um, I have a remark and then one question. Sure. The, the remark is just about the use of the name Kuramoto because uh, Sure. Gramoto is with uh, random frequencies and is really not a, a gradient flow. If you take away the random frequencies, then it's a classical model of statistical mechanics uh, with a pompous name, they call it classical XY model. Maybe mean field plane rotators, but it's really one of the most basic uh, models of N and is, is a gradient flow. And, okay, but uh, with respect to your result, uh, can you apply them to that model? To which one? To, to the classical XY model? To the yeah. So in all the regimes? So no, so no you, you can, I mean, if you fix, if you, yeah, if you take the, the model I was putting here, the cosine, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. So that, that is the good convexity properties. Then. Yeah, yeah, so it's like... It, and, and also if you, uh, how much can you move? Because, uh, the, I mean, in general, that's just the case of... Uh, uh, the easiest uh, model, which is reversible gradient flow, but uh, uh, you could take any even potential and... Uh, so it's a matter of regularity, so you, what you need to check is that the second derivative of this interaction energy is bounded below by a uh, constant lambda, that's the lambda complexity function, and that's it. That's another question or comment? Gamma convergence is sometimes used to get rid of, uh, to choose a special solution when you have a degenerate, degeneracy of state. In, in this case, is it used for the same purpose? So, okay, the, you need to think of uh, a different way. So what it gets used to the, uh, talk about non-degenerate states is the fact that you're looking at the energy minimizer. So the, the minimizing the energy is what would tell you that this is a better solution than the other one. But here, what you're saying is that there is a degeneracy with respect to the, the minimums of the energy, okay? So the minimum is not unique, but you have a, a whole family of them, and that's, yeah. then, then, I mean, all of them are equivalent, in, in, in some sense. In your lambda convexity recital, on <coughs> n, you let this minimum be zero, so back if, even if lambda is positive, why can't you get? Uh, because the, the, it becomes a little degenerate in the sense that, I mean, the, 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 if you look, think of it, you have w, y, w of xi minus xj. So if you look in the direction that you perturb xi and xj in the same way, Okay, so then yeah, there, so there is a zero. If not, let's thank Matthias again.